In 1992, together with a group of graduate students and postdocs, biology professor Dorothy Cheney and psychology professor Robert Seyfarth began a long-term study of free-ranging baboons in the Okavango Delta of Botswana. The wife and husband team spent the next decade and a half documenting the behavior, communication, and social cognition of these group-living primates. This work culminated in their highly influential 2007 book, Baboon Metaphysics. We spoke with the professors about their perspectives on lifelong work in the field. And one of the earliest experiments we did was one to see whether the animals recognize each other by voice. And the way we set the experiment up is we waited until three monkeys were sitting together, all mothers. And we played to these three females the distress scream that, you know, you give during aggression of one of their offspring. So one of the females is, is a mother and the other two are not. There are other females in the group. And the interesting result that we got that was sort of a surprise at the time was that the mothers did respond to their offspring's cry, but the other two females looked at the mother as if to say, I know that scream, that's that juvenile, and that juvenile goes with you. And that was the first indication that you could that the animals recognized the relationships that existed among others, and you could demonstrate this experimentally. And so I guess if there was an aha moment, that would be an aha moment, because you're suddenly dealing not just with individuals interacting with each other, but also individuals who are acutely aware of and interested in the relationships that pertain among other individuals in the group. So they're voyeurs, essentially. They're, they're basically um, into gossip. And I think it's important also to say that at that time, nobody studied individuals. Um, people would go out and look at, look at animals and say, this is what males do, this is what females do, this is what juveniles do. And of course, when you're thinking about evolution and natural selection, the really important thing is variation among individuals and who, who grooms with whom, who does well, not just who's dominant to whom, but also who's able to form strategic relationships. And so we were really lucky to get in at the ground level, I guess, because prior to the work that we had done, really no one had looked at individuals. And the first person actually to really to do this would, was Jane Goodall. And a lot of scientists criticized her for being overly anthropomorphic and trying to give her study subjects personality and so on. But it turned out, of course, that she was, she was right. During their time in the field, Cheney and Seyfarth witnessed behaviors that would come to challenge established theories about primates' social hierarchies, reproduction, and competition. We always sort of thought that if you studied the animals for a long enough time, you'd find that high-ranking animals had an advantage over others. Females, but historically, And certainly females. But the skew in reproduction is not that great in these groups. Low-ranking animals are, are still breeding. But to understand the lifetime reproductive success of a female baboon, you've got to study the same individuals over and over continuously for 20 years or so. And so what we have found, along with other people, and people are beginning to see this also in other species of animals, is that um, dominance ranks does contribute to reproductive success, as you would imagine, um, particularly in bottleneck years if food is scarce. But the primary determinant, determinant of reproductive success in females is social bonds. So we can look at females with strong social bonds, and now we know strong social networks beyond the level of just the dyadic relationship, um, have offspring that live for longer, and they themselves also live longer. We find in all of these groups that even the lowest ranking female is able to breed. She has lots of children, and that immediately suggests that there are sort of alternative strategies that perhaps these animals pursue that allow you to sort of circumvent the rank into which you were born. And it seems in this case that it's really having close friends and social relationships that makes a difference. Same, the same is what you find in humans, that what really contributes most to health in human society is your social network. 
And it's sort of like that with, with these baboons as well. In this structure of society, it introduces the fundamental dilemma that a group living animal faces that is uh, the balance of competition and cooperation. All baboons are better off living in a group than being on their own. And yet, when you join a group, you also get, inquire a number of competitors. And they're also allies. So primates face one of the complications that will sound very familiar to humans, uh, how to balance competition and cooperation, particularly when you're going to compete with the same animals you're going to cooperate with. And this is the dilemma faced by a lot of group living animals that live for long periods of time and interact over and over again with the same individuals. We prefer working on animals in the wild because you can study them in the context in which presumably these behaviors evolved um, without the interference of humans. But we lived in tents. You have a lot of other animals that wander through elephants and lions. And where we worked in Botswana, it's flooded for most of the year, so you can only um, gain access to it most of the time by boat, which is a logistical nightmare, because also all your work is done on foot. And that was one of the reasons in the end we had to stop this project because there, the increase in elephants has been so tremendous in Botswana that it's not safe to work on foot anymore. But we did have a, a great life in our camp in Botswana and we have two daughters and they spent about half their life until high school going back and forth to these tents where they would more or less teach themselves school. Uh, homeschooling makes it sound like we did a lot and we did do some, but they mainly took the books, got told by their school where they ought to be when they get back and, and arranged to be there. And Our kids, I think, I know would say that this was a tremendously important part of their, their childhood. And even after they be got, went to high school and college, they still wanted to go back every summer and did go back every summer. And neither of them studies animals, but they, but I think they would both say that they are, um, they, I know they would both say that they had a tremendous upbringing. It's um, perhaps not realistic, but it was a lot of fun. Cheney and Seyfarth say the data gleaned from observation in the field can be used to better understand mechanisms in the primate's brain. This integration of field and lab work is key to new advances in the study of the evolution of social behaviors. We're willing to give up some of the things that you have to give up when you do field work. We aren't able to study brain mechanisms. Only recently has it become possible to study in a natural way hormones and also to get genetic information about the animals. So you give up a lot, a lot scientifically and a lot of precision, but you give up a lot of things to study the brain mechanisms that govern what monkeys do. So the, the best is for these, these two sorts of approaches to feed off each other. But we've been really lucky to work with some fantastic grad students and postdocs, and so that has also been not only sort of scientifically productive, but really fun. You know, I, I actually think that we've learned a tremendous amount about social behavior, which certainly was not anticipated. But I think for us, the big change came several years ago when we were finally able to relate all the behavior and sort of cognitive experiments that we'd done back to fitness, back to who's actually leaving the most offspring and who's actually living the longest. And that took 25 years because you don't get those data overnight. And But I think that really is what changed everything for me, that we can finally say, oh, animals who have close social bonds actually do benefit. Before that, it was a bunch of hand-waving. And, and of course, you know that makes it, I think, all the more important that as we go along and we become more delving more deeply into the brain and looking more at the physiological and neural mechanisms, which is incredibly important, at some level people are still looking at the big picture and saying, does this actually make a difference in terms of fitness? Mm -hmm.